Um, but as you know, over the last month, um, we've been going through a series from the book of Revelation called With the End in View. Um, we've been covering the first few chapters of Revelation as Jesus has been addressing each of the seven churches in Asia Minor. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea in a letter format. Is, is that a seven? I think that's seven. Yeah, that's seven. And like, I've, like we've shared before, each of these seven letters had a similar pattern or structure in the way these letters were written. There was an address. Uh, basically, the letter started off by saying, to the angel of the church in such and such a place. Um, and then there were attributes of Jesus that were described, um, oftentimes depicted of him in glory. Um, and then Jesus begins the letter by basically uh, commending the church in that particular city, uh, commending them for their strengths. Um, and in one case, he doesn't commend them, which we'll cover today. Uh, but then he also corrects and rebukes them. Uh, but I have this against you, the weaknesses of that particular church, um, a failure. Um, and he basically condemns all of the seven except for two, which we covered that first week, the churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia. And then he offers some counsel, a prescription for change, uh, some encouragement and some instruction, um, an exhortation to really change and to really uh, shape it up, right? And then he concludes with the promise or reward. Uh, basically, to him who overcomes, such and such will happen. And I started a few weeks back, about a month ago, uh, with what Pastor Ted called the A-plus churches, the churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia, where really Jesus had nothing bad to say, but really praised them for their patient endurance and faithfulness in the midst of suffering. And even though they were small and weak churches in the eyes of the world, Christ had a different standard uh, in the way he measured them, in the way he um, assessed that church or those churches. Now, a couple of Sundays ago, Pastor Ted uh, covered the C-plus churches, three churches, Ephesus, Pergamum, and Thyatira. Now, these churches were commended for their works, but they were also warned to stay faithful in the midst of the idolatry around them. Um, it was really a warning for the compromised. And that the things that matter to Jesus isn't what's on the outward appearance, not what's visible, but rather things that are hidden, that are invisible, things that are internal in our hearts, in our minds. Now, obviously, Jesus knows our hearts and our minds, um, but we need to allow Christ to be formed in us daily, allowing him to renew, to transform our thoughts and our hearts. And last week, Pastor John covered the beginning of the two failing churches. Uh, he covered the church in Sardis and how they basically needed to wake up and not rest on their laurels, not rest on their past accomplishments or their reputation, um, and to really wake up, to wake up to the life that Jesus had for them. Similarly, we were all challenged to not rest on what God may have done in our lives in the past or in our church, but to really pursue the name that Jesus has for us in this new season. Now, as you've seen, as we've gone throughout the last few weeks, um, it hasn't been a progression. It's been rather a degression of sorts, starting with the A-plus churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, then to the C-plus churches, Ephesus, Pergamum, and Thyatira. And then last week, starting with the F churches, Sardis, and today, finishing up with the church of Laodicea. So I'm going to ask all of us to stand one more time as we read our passage today from Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. Let's read this all in one verse. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, 
I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, most of us may be sort of familiar with the Church of Laodicea. Um, it's pretty descriptive. You know, you talk, you hear about the vivid imagery of the lukewarm, of the cold, of the hot, and, and, and really, none of us, to be honest, want to be lukewarm. We don't want to be spit out of anyone's mouth, right? But to really further understand this passage, I want to start by really giving a little bit of introduction and background to the city of Laodicea. Now, this city of Laodicea was located in the Lysus River Valley of Asia Minor, which is now the western part of Turkey, right? Oz, right? You're Turkish. You, you should, you, hopefully, you'll know this, right? I don't know my Turkish geography as well, but I'm sure you do. Uh, you no, know, the city really shared a prosperous trade route with two other cities, Hierapolis and Colossae, and the confluence of these cities um, made it so that where Laodicea was located, it was really critical for trade and communications in that province. Now, in fact, Laodicea was the wealthiest of the seven cities that we've looked at. And it actually developed into a wealthy commercial and administrative center. Now, the city was known throughout the Roman Empire for three main things. For money, for textiles, for wool, and for eye medicine. So for money, it was really a center of finance, of banking, and commerce, uh, known for its wealth and its financial power and stability. Uh, it was renowned in the textile field. Uh, it was renowned for soft, glossy black wool that was produced from the sheep that grazed in the pastures of Laodicea. And this wool, this black wool, was considered a luxury item and it was desired for clothing and also uh, woven into carpets at the time. And it was also a significant source of revenue for the people of Laodicea. But Laodicea also had a very well-known medical school and produced compounded medicines. Uh, notably, uh, from the rocks in the area, there was an eye ointment that was made from the rocks that they pulverized. And it was really useful in curing certain eye diseases. So these three things, wealth, wool, textiles, and medicine. Now, but there were also two drawbacks of the location of Laodicea, of its physical location. Uh, Laodicea was located in a region that was prone to earthquakes. And in the year AD 60, there was one that literally almost destroyed the city. But unlike the surrounding towns of the region, um, after the destruction, after the earthquake, the Roman Empire, the Roman government, tried to help the people of Laodicea. But the Laodiceans, because they were so wealthy and self-sufficient, that they basically said, no, no thanks, Rome. We got it on our own. We can rebuild. And it's said that the reconstruction of the city was actually more, was, the grandeur was greater than the old city that was destroyed because they had so much wealth. Now the second thing about Laodicea that was a drawback was that the city itself actually lacked an adequate source of water. It had to depend on piping in an external water source from about six miles away, from a spring about six miles away um, via an aqueduct. Um, now, this really left the city quite vulnerable uh, to the potential that the spring would dry up during the summer or potential enemies that would come and cut off the water supply via the aqueduct system. Can you imagine just maybe putting in poison or tainting the water supply as it traveled the six miles into the town of Laodicea? So, some things that the city is known for and some drawbacks. Now, Jesus begins this letter to the church of Laodicea, of course, with the description of himself. In verse 14, it talks about the amen, the faithful, and of him being the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. But he goes right into the letter where normally in the other six letters, 
he would be commending the local church for their strengths. But in this particular case, in this only letter, he basically starts condemning the church of Laodicea. This is the only letter out of seven where Jesus doesn't have anything to say, anything good to say about this church. He basically, in verse 15, says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, it says, he says, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now that's a very scary thing. It doesn't sound good. It just sounds like, oh, so horrible, right? Like, you don't want to be spit out of Jesus' mouth. Now this is a, a passage that, you know, when we think about the seven churches, this is one that stands out because we all know that Laodicea is bad. We all know that they're lukewarm. We all know that the church there is, you know, going to be spit out of Jesus' mouth. But a way to understand this passage is to really look at the geographical context of the city of Laodicea. Now, some scholars have said that the metaphor that Jesus has used to describe the water, the hot, the cold, and the lukewarm, it really stems to Laodicea's water supply. Now, historians have told us that six miles to the north of Laodicea lies a city called Hierapolis. And this city was famous for its hot springs that had medicinal and healing properties. So the hot water, the hot springs. I don't know how many of you have been to hot springs or taken a hot springs bath, or in Japan they have those onsens where like you, you go to these hot springs. I haven't been, but I'm sure I see some nods, right? Hot springs, so, so, so it's supposed to have like a curative effect, a very soothing effect, a very nice, I don't know, mineralizing effect, right? So that was the city of Hierapolis, six miles to the north of Laodicea. And then 10 miles, let's see, which is east? This, northeast, right? So 10 miles to the east was a town named Colossae. And this town was known for its cold, pure drinking water, refreshing water that was, you know, good for any hot, summery day that was meant to cool you down after exercising or running or, or just when you're thirsty, you know, like maybe some of us are right now. Now, earlier I mentioned that because there was no convenient water source in the town of Laodicea, they had to, not truck in water, but pipe in water through the aqueduct system. And it was from another town about six miles away. Now, when the water was piped in from the about six miles away, this water actually didn't have enough time to cool in the stone aqueducts. But it actually, when it got to Laodicea, the water was actually lukewarm. It was basically useless for either healing or refreshment. It wasn't like the waters of Hierapolis up north or the waters of Colossae out east where it was refreshing. The water of Laodicea that they received was not good for refreshment or bathing. Um, it most likely would have been tepid, uh, foul-smelling, cloudy, repulsive, full of minerals. And, and who knows what goes on in that six miles as it traverses the aqueduct system, right? Now, the believers that were listening from this church, they would understand the uselessness of lukewarm water. You know, water was such a commodity in those days, not like us where, you know, you turn on the faucet, you turn on the tap, and, you know, you get hot water, you get cold water instantaneously, right? But back in those days, water was such a precious commodity. And when that local town did not have its own water source and was relying on something to be piped in, it was quite a precious thing. Unfortunately, the church of Laodicea should not have been matched by description by its water supply, how Jesus calls it lukewarm. But really, the church should have been known for either their healing properties or the spiritual healing environment of the church, just like the hot springs from north in Hierapolis for the spiritually sick, or they should have been known for their refreshing, life-giving ministry, just like the cold water from the town on the east from Colossae for the spiritually weary and thirsty and dry. You know, the church in Laodicea had not unfortunately produced any works worthy of the Lord's affirmation. And basically, the way Jesus put it, this church 
was really useless to him. He could only condemn their actions. He didn't have anything good to say or the lack of actions. And he basically said, because you're lukewarm, watch out. I'm going to spit you out because you're nauseating. You make me sick, basically. Right? You're of no use to me. You're not hot like the hot springs. You're not cold like the refreshing water. You know, a lot of times when we think of, you know, hot, being hot, passionate for Jesus, or, or being cold, like, so I think sometimes we think of, like, the, 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 the difference between hot and cold, like, it's almost like Jesus would rather be you hot or cold. But when we understand this, the area of the water, it's, it's not the coldness of heart, but it's really the cold, refreshing spring that the Colossae waters, the Colossian waters brought, okay? And I know, you know, a lot of times we think of this passage as, okay, you know, Jesus would rather be you cold or hot but not lukewarm. I don't know if it's necessarily like that. I think it's really understanding the context of the water in that area, right? But brothers and sisters, the church in Laodicea not only was lukewarm, they were ambivalent. They were complacent. They were nominal. They were going through the motions without any life change, without any of the transforming power that Jesus so much wanted to give them, that faith in Christ produces. Brothers and sisters, what is the temperature of our water source today? Is it hot? On fire? Is it cold, but in a positive, cold, refreshing way where it's rest for the weary soul, where it's life, where it speaks life, where it's refreshing to those that are weary? Or is our water Have we become so spiritually comfortable with our lives? I know a lot of us have been Christians for many years. Right? Have we been just so spiritually complacent, perhaps even apathetic? You know, just kind of checking the boxes. Oh, I went to church. I went to small group. I read my Bible. I did my daily prayer. But not really allowing the Holy Spirit to change us. Not allowing, not giving room to the Holy Spirit to really transform our lives. To surrender and to say, Jesus, what is more that you want from me? There must be more. And what is that more? Have we just been playing church? Coming day, week in, week out, right? Coming to New Vine, going to small group, enjoying our fellowship during dinner, and just going through the motions. But really, again, Jesus is looking at our hearts. Jesus is looking at my heart. He's looking at your heart. What is our heart condition today? Now, Jesus continues in this letter, and we see that in the next verse, in verse 17, that the church had other spiritual issues, that it wasn't just lukewarmness that was the matter. Um, but we also see, starting in verse 17, that the problem was that the Laodiceans were actually quite wealthy. They had a lot of resources. And that wealth, unfortunately, led to a lot of self-sufficiency and ultimately complacency. Verse 17, Jesus says to the Laodiceans, for, for the church, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And further, Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from you, find by fire, so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. With their apathy, they were actually blinded to their true condition. There was a perception problem. They really thought they were okay. They really thought that, hey, I'm actually doing all right. You know, I've, I've got resources, but unfortunately, because of the resources that they had, they really were not able to see their true spiritual condition, their true state. And Jesus was now shaking them up, basically waking them up to say, you know what, you think that you're rich. You 
be rich from a worldly perspective, but you're ultimately wretched and poor spiritually. Even though outwardly you have material wealth, even though you may be, you know, driving whatever, I don't know, I guess they didn't drive back then, whatever chariot, no, I don't know, what do they have? A horse cart? Whatever cart they pulled, whatever, whatever transportation they had, the Mercedes, the Teslas of the, the day, right? Um, you think you're rich? No, you're actually poor. They claim to be blessed and self-sufficient. They didn't need anything from the Lord. They didn't need anything from the Roman government when their town was destroyed, right? They're like, Rome, save your money for another city. We don't need it. And the church, unfortunately, thought that because they were physically rich, they were also spiritually wealthy. But Jesus is now saying, you're wrong. You're actually poor, spiritually poor. depend on the Lord, right? They were living in a wealthy city with the bustling economy, and we can imagine that some of the church members probably lived very affluently. Um, they not only thought of themselves as materially wealthy, but also, again, spiritually wealthy, and that they maybe assumed that because they enjoyed such a lifestyle and they didn't have any persecution, that perhaps God's favor was upon them, that, in fact, it was maybe God's blessing. But Jesus is now saying, no. You're actually spiritually poor. You actually need to buy gold from me. They were wretched. They had a pitiful condition. But worse, they couldn't see it until now. Until when Jesus basically said, wake up, church. You need to see your spiritual state as is. Don't be fooled by what you think you have. Jesus not only reveals their true condition, but he further on actually offers a solution, right? He basically says, I see your need, and here is the solution. Now, the solution was threefold, okay? But it basically connects to the three things that the city was known for. Remember? The wealth, the banking industry, the textile industry, the wool, and the medical school, the South. In verse 18, Jesus tells the church, I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the state of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you can see. Now, we don't have too much time to go over these three things, but basically, Jesus is saying, you're actually poor, but you can, I counsel you, you can, there's a solution. You can buy from me this gold that's refined by fire. You know, the gold that, that, that is tested, that, that all the dross is burned away, that is actually pure gold. White garments symbolizing righteousness, covering their shame, covering their nakedness, representing the righteous life that he wants us as believers to live. Not our own righteousness. We can't do much, but Jesus is righteousness. And the third thing, this salve that the city was known for so that they could actually see they could really recover from the spiritual uh, eye ailments, the spiritual blindness, that Jesus would really reveal to them their true spiritual state. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of times we think of this church of Laodicea as almost like the worst, and it probably was because of Jesus' harsh words. But, Jesus not only offers a solution, he also gives an invitation. You know, you would think that if this was really that worse of a church, wouldn't it be easier for Jesus just to, like, spit them out, right? Like, done with you. Like, you're no good. You're, you're just wretched. Like, that's it. But that's not what he does. In verse 19, Jesus' invitation to the church, he says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Those whom I love, he still loves this church, even though they are lukewarm, even though they are apathetic, even though they haven't done much for him. He says, those whom I love, he reproves and disciplines. 
he reminds him of an important aspect of his nature, that basically he loves to correct and sometimes punish. You know, it's just like being a parent. You know, I don't think as, a, as parents, none of us like to punish our kids. But because we want to teach them the difference between good and evil, the, the good thing and the bad thing, because we need to teach them right from wrong, that sometimes we might need to punish them. Sometimes we need to set boundaries. Sometimes we, we may need to, you know, take away rights or even, you know, <laughs> whatever, right? So, but, but it's not that we want to hurt them. It's because we want to teach them. It's out of love that we want to, to correct, right, to, to rebuke, to really show them the ways that are right. And this is how Christ is with his church. His rebuke is not born out of animosity, but of love. In Hebrews verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 6, it says, The Lord disciplines those he loves. In Romans 2, verse 4, it says, God's kindness is meant to lead us is meant to lead you to repentance. It's because of his kindness that he wants to lead us to repentance. Now, the desired response to God's rebuke to the church of Laodicea was really zealous change and true repentance. It says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. So Jesus is inviting the church to be zealous, to repent, to wake up, to see your spiritual condition, and to repent. In verse 20, he goes further. He's not done yet, okay? He's not just saying, hey, I'm going to rebuke you. I'm going to correct you. I'm going to, you know, discipline you so that you can repent. But he goes further to verse 20 to say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, I know in all of us, Think of verse 20. It's been used in many evangelistic contexts or appeals, right? You, you remember, you, some of you may remember a painting seeing Jesus knocking on the door, right? I think it's a very familiar painting. But in this original context, it's really addressed, not necessarily in an evangelistic way, but it's really addressed to this lukewarm church in Laodicea. It's really addressed to the people that have been apathetic, the people that have been complacent, the people that have not borne any fruit the patient Jesus, even though the church has kept him out, he's knocking. Rather than turn his back on this church, rather than spitting them out of his mouth, he's coming to this lukewarm church for a desire to fellowship. Even though the church was nominally Christian, even though Christ was locked out, he knocks seeking someone, anyone, to open that door. It's so amazing, right? Because you would think, oh, I don't know, at least that's why I'm not God. But I feel like I'm done with you. Like, good riddance, just get punished and whatever, right? But this is not the heart of Christ. The heart of Christ is he's waiting. He's knocking. And the thing is, is, He's a gentleman. He's not going to force his way in. Okay, you know that when Jesus rose from the dead, he could come through doors, right? He doesn't have to wait behind a locked door. He could just appear, right? That's what he did to the disciples. But here in this picture, addressing to the church of Laodicea, he's outside knocking a gentleman, waiting for someone to let him in. Amazing. Now, Pastor Ted has said that a lot of these church, uh, these, these letters, all of the letters, they're addressing the church as a whole in the beginning. But in the end, in the invitation, it's actually addressed to individuals. Just as verse 20, it, is, it actually says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, if anyone, not the whole church, but if anyone, even if just one person hears my voice and opens a door, I will come into him and eat with him. So he individualizes it to the specific people in the church. He's knocking. He's waiting. He is basically not forcing in, but he's making himself available. It's up to you and I 
to open that door. He actually wants to feast with us, to sit at table with us. He desires for fellowship, for a relationship. He doesn't desire necessarily for works, okay? He desires our hearts, the things that are unseen, the things that are not visible. It's the relationship that he's after. Now, this picture is him wanting to come in to share a meal. This is a really beautiful picture of a Middle Eastern um, culture, and even some of our cultures today, of not only hospitality, but of eating together, of dining together, intimate fellowship and friendship. You know, um, when Kidani's family came from Eritrea, they invited um, me over to their home. And in their culture, it's just very hospitable. You know, they, they were serving coffee. They were serving a meal. And, and I felt very bad because I was looking at my watch, and I was like, I really have to go. And they're like, no, 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 have another cup of coffee. Have another cup of coffee. But, you know, it's very cultural for, for people to invite you in. And to stay a while. I think those of us on the, you know, that, that were raised here in the West, we're always like, oh, I, gotta, you know, I got places to go, people to see. I got to go to my next appointment. I got to do my next thing. But in, in these cultures, it, it wasn't about time. Time was not really a, a big concept. It was about spending time with each other. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. He wants to come in to spend time with you and I to fellowship, to break bread, to share a meal, friendship with our Savior. It's a covenant relationship signified by breaking bread together. And that's why we eat together at New Vine. Okay, not tonight. <laughs> every other week for now, but eventually we'll get back to every week. That's really why we want to gather together as a family, as a body of believers, you know, to break bread together. And once a month, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We'll be breaking bread later as we celebrate and remember what Jesus has done on the cross for us. But this is the concept that Jesus invites us in. Well, he's asking for us to let him in, right, in this, in this particular passage, right? Will we open the door to the Lord? to say, yes, Lord, come in so that we can be together, so that we can sit for a while, not looking at the clock, not thinking about what we have to do next. I go back to the fact that Jesus could have just been done with this church of Laodicea. It, sounded so, it sounds so dire, right? Lukewarm, apathetic, complacent, no works at all. And Jesus was saying that he would spit them out because they're so lukewarm. But he doesn't do that. He rebukes. He corrects out of love. But he offers a way, a solution. He offers them gold, white garments, and eye salve. Things that really speak to their hearts. Things that they were known for. Right? It's amazing how... When Jesus addresses the church, that he knows exactly what they need to hear. Just like when he addresses us today, he knows exactly your needs and my needs. And then he takes it one step further, not only to show them their spiritual situation, condition, their poverty, but he brings them to repentance. He invites them to repent, right? He takes it one step further. He stands at the door. He knocks to see if anyone is listening, to see if anyone is willing to open that door so that he can come in, share a meal, eat together, fellowship, and to enter in to a covenant relationship. You know, as we prepare our hearts for communion today. If you haven't yet received the elements as you walked in, could you just raise your hand and we'll be passing them out um, um, for you. Just raise your hands a little higher. If you haven't received the bread and the Margaret's in the back passing it out. But as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper today, I want to ask you, 
as we conclude, what about us today? Where are we? Are we perhaps lukewarm? Are we comfortable, perhaps apathetic? Maybe too many resources enough to depend on God. Do we really see our spiritual state? Do we really see perhaps we're not as good as we think we are? Or we're not as okay as we think we are? Do we, really, do we need the Lord to give us, open our eyes to see our spiritual state? Do we need to repent? Do we perhaps need to buy gold from Jesus? Refined in the fire? Do we need his righteous garments to clothe our shame, to clothe our nakedness? Jesus is so loving. He could have just been done with us a while back, right? But he chooses not to. He chooses to invite us. He chooses to stand at the door and to knock. Will we be willing to open the door to him? I'm going to invite you to stand as we prepare for the communion. I'm going to ask Pastor John to to come up and and really um, prepare our hearts. But I want to just spend this time with you and just ask you to reflect on what Jesus has done, how he may be speaking to you even today, where you're at. You know, let's be honest with the Lord. Let's not, it's between you and him. You know, let's not sugarcoat it. You don't have to share it with anyone. But let's just spend some time coming before the Lord, asking him to examine our hearts, to examine the temperature of the water. You know, is it lukewarm? And if it is, ask the Lord, God, take away that lukewarmness. Take away my apathy. Stir me up so that I can once again have a passion for you. Give me your hot things, right, or your cool refreshment so that I can be a blessing to others. Just spend some time before the Lord as we reflect. Jesus, we come before you and we say, Jesus, we want to meet with you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your kindness, for your kind invitation that you want to meet with your people, that you want to meet with your sons and your daughters. So, Jesus, we thank you for that preciousness that you, Almighty God, the Holy of Holies, would want to make your dwelling among us today. Lord, we thank you for visiting us. Lord, we ask, God, that you would continue to visit us, continue to speak, that we would continue to hold on to you, that, Jesus, you would continue to move in our hearts. Lord, we are not enough unless you come. We are nothing unless you meet us here again. So, Father, we pray, God, that even as we continue to meet you here, as we continue to declare your goodness, as we continue to share and to pray with one another, that you would once again meet us here. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you have done, the work that you are doing, and the work that you continue to do. And we ask for more of that for more of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our community, and in this church. Jesus, we love you. Lord, we want to be a church that is hot for you. We want to be a church that is refreshing for you. We want to be a church that loves you, that loves your people, that loves the lost. So give us that heart. Give us that love, Jesus, for it's in your name that we pray. Amen.